I wonder who it is that uh, the atheists and those who just believe that it happened all by accident, I wonder who they give thanks to for the breath that they draw, the food that they eat, the rest that they sleep, the joy that they feel, the love that they know. <laughs> ah. I pray today that every man and every woman, every boy and every girl across the county of San Diego comes to realize how much God loves them, how, how much they've been lied to, all the propaganda, all the nonsense, that so-called truth that goes against every apparent visible thing that can be observed even by a little child. I pray in the name of Jesus that that nonsense, that harassment, those lies will be broken off and everybody can just get real for like five minutes and begin to understand what a wonderful miracle it is. I was standing over the shoulder the other day of a embryologist and we had just fertilized some embryos with just all the advanced technology and we we're looking at the zona pellucida and I said look at that tell me that there is not the power of the living God visible before our eyes he just said well it's certainly something that goes beyond all explanation oh yeah it truly is what God did for us when he sent his only begotten son Jesus Christ into the world to think of the love of God, to think of God's love. It would be only possible, Satan is a strong man, the power of darkness, and somebody said, I don't believe in Satan. Well, just look around for in just a few minutes. Goodness gracious. Without the mercies of God, men would have already self-destructed. The evidence of that is clear, it's mounting. I'm looking at a swath of Syria, Iraq, Iran, an ancient empire that existed clearly existed uh, 4,000 years ago, more than likely existed before then, as it begins now to, to fight to emerge again, the ancient empire of Assyria. Yeah, that's the heart of it. Syria, Iraq, right through the middle of Iraq, Iran. That's all accidents and accidents because the Bible very clearly tells us that the Assyrian will rise again. It, the Assyrian is the way that the prophets referred to the one that men have come to know and call the Antichrist because he was only really identified as the Antichrist as the opposition, op, uh, the opposite and the opposition of Christ, Christ Jesus. The stronger one came, God Almighty, the stronger one came as a baby born in Bethlehem to which the whole world celebrates. Now, I know that there are Hindus that don't really celebrate that, and then there's Buddhists that don't really celebrate that, and there's people in the jungles who worship demon spirits, and they know they worship demon spirits, and they make sacrifice to demons so that they, the demons won't come in and kill their children and all the rest of the stuff. And the anthropologists want us to leave them alone, and I said to an anthropologist one day, oh, really? You want to leave, you want to leave the people of Irian Jaya? You want to leave the mountain people of Papua New Guinea alone? and they're gonna have that kind of lifestyle? Give me a break. And I'm, I'm gonna run right over top of your ideology. I'm running right over top of you trying to hold the power of superstition and demon persuasion over our people's lives. Christ Jesus, the stronger one came, broke off the yoke of a satanic stronghold that grips the heart of men. He did it in such a way that it's almost um, it's unimaginable. He who is rich, he who created everything, he, in other words, he who had all the wealth and had all the possession of everything, it all belonged to him. Father created everything by him. He said, Father, I'll go because what it's going to take is going to take absolute holiness and purity to break off the strong man. He says, I'm going to go, basically, and he described it in a different way when he stood on the earth. He described it in the present tense, but in the future tense, I can hear the Lord Jesus saying, because I know the word of God doesn't change. He says, I'm, I'm going to go and I'm going to spoil the strong man's house. 
I'm going to strip him of all of his power off of everyone who will believe. All of his torment, all of his harassment, all of his sickness, all of his disease, all of his sin. I'm going to strip it off of him. And I'm going to liberate anybody who will believe. I believed. Hundreds of millions of people have believed since Jesus Christ. Offered the greatest sacrifice, gave the greatest revelation, declaration of the power of God. Far more powerful than the sun that shines. Far more powerful than the solar system that it defines. Far more powerful than the galaxies which could not be numbered. Though the lens of the microscope, though the lens of the telescope be polished and photomultiplier tubes be made stronger than anybody could ever imagine, still the smallest little infinite thing in life would continue to be detected more and more and more. And the greatest outreaches of space and time continue to be explored. Every year they have to redefine exactly how old or how long ago the bang took place. Because when they figure, well, it should be right out here now. We should be right on the edge. We should be able to see it. No. It keeps expanding. The expanse is as eternal and as infinite as he is. It didn't start 6,000 years ago. It didn't start 6 million. It didn't start 6 billion. He's forever and forever. It didn't start 6 trillion. Huh? It didn't start 6 zeptillion. Six times 10 to the 21st. That's a big number. Six, comma, 26 zeros. <laughs> or to the hundred. Or to the factorial power of 1,000. How big is that? That's huge. That's bigger than, that's more than zeros than we can talk about. I'd have to get a calculator out to figure that one out. How many, how many zeros is that, Catherine? <laughs> Father, Father loves you. Father loves us. He proves it. The most reproducible thing that exists. You can be seated. His love for you and me is the most reproducible thing. Every morning you wake up to it. His mercy is the most reproducible thing that exists. Every morning you wake up to it. His grace, His forgiveness is the most reproducible thing that exists. Every time you do something wrong, you want to make it right. It's there, God's love there proving himself to us. There's no joy like this, nothing, nothing, no pleasure, no moment of excitement, no great event in our life great exciting wonderful event in our life can reproduce this joy this joy is <laughs> so far beyond this peace hallelujah his love oh blessed is his holy name his love he who is rich, who created all things by his power, who upheld all things by the authority of his word, for our sake became poor. There was no room for him in this world, and there's never going to be room for him in this world. In the sociology of men, there's no room for him. In the psychology of men, there's no room for him. In the ideology and philosophies of men, there no, there's no room for him. So they went around, is there any room here? No, there's no room. He could have been born in the ivory palaces of this world, but he was not born there. You say, well, Father could have made a way for him to have a room, at least in the end. No, Father would have said, no, I'm going to show you. There's no room for him. He'd be born out in the field. He'd be born out in the field. He'd be born in a little area separated 
where man doesn't stay. He who is rich for our sakes became poor. He laid it all aside so that he could live out a life every day proving that sin and demonic influences had no place in that life that God created in his image and his likeness. When he shaped Adam from the small dust of the earth. Somebody said it didn't happen that way. Yeah, it did. Oh, no, I didn't. Prove it. And nobody can prove that it didn't happen that way. Nobody can prove that it didn't happen that way. Nate, no one can even find a loophole here. I can find thousands of loopholes in, in evolution. I can find thousands of, of loopholes in the ideology centered around genetics and molecular biology. They would try to explain life. You can't, even, you can't even by science explain the smallest little strand of RNA that's not even complicated enough to produce just one of your small proteins in your body. I can show you, I can show you literally hundreds of problems with the ideology that that happened by random events. There's not enough time. Put it in the statistical model, there's not enough time. You cannot show me one proof or evidence that would, that would stand against God shaping Adam in his image and in his likeness. And then what he did, does is he comes and gives us the greatest evidence of all. When a virgin, when a virgin, a young woman who never knew a man suddenly was pregnant by the power of the Holy Ghost, an angel came to her and visited her. Uh huh. Huh. Muhammad said that an angel came to him and visited him, but he never had any evidence or proof of that. Uh-uh, not one, shred. And what he could not accomplish through is what he said was divine power backing him up. All he did was take the sword and try to accomplish it through slaughter, mayhem, death, and destruction. Had no proof. Mary had proof that an angel named Gabriel. Hallelujah came to her because her belly started growing with the life of God. She never knew a man. Uh, the power of the Most High overshadowed her. Hallelujah. The li- a close encounter with the living God. Amen. Amasapaya. God was willing to become a holy embryo, an embryo to be implanted into the womb of a virgin named Mary. Amazing. I think there's probably, I think there's an estimated, when you take all of Christendom, Roman Catholic Church, all of the various different expressions, there's more than, there's more than two billion. I think it's closer to two and a half billion people that believe that the gospel story that God became a holy embryo and was born of a virgin named Mary in a place called Bethlehem of Judea, a little small nation of Israel. God manifested in the flesh, Emmanuel. All those things which those men, those, those who were touched by the power of God had prophesied since the beginning of humanity as we understand it and know it today, which took place about 6,000 years ago. Somebody said, well, what was going on before that? Well, there's explanations we can tell you about that. God reveals it in his word, but we just, we're talking about the more important subject right now. We're talking about you right here, right now, not what your ancestors looked like 5,000 years ago. We're not talking about what happened. We're not talking about what happened in the infinite past has no relevance really to you right now and your decisions and what you're going to do with the rest of your life and where you're going to spend an eternity. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that not one single person in this place rejects the only means by which you can be set free from the strongholds of Satan that would claim your soul for, for the ages. God has made a way. If God commended his love towards us that when we were dead in trespasses and sins, he showed us so much love. He freely gave us all things. How much shall he not now 
also by Christ Jesus give us everything that we have need of. If he commended his love, if God spared not his own son, as Paul said, and boy, what a, what a witness to the resurrection of Jesus. Paul, who's Saul, comes from a wealthy, influential family, set at the feet of the greatest rabbi of his day, has a visitation from the resurrected Jesus. He said, if Father of God commended his love to us, if God spared not his own son, if God the Father spared not his own son, but freely offered him up for us all, he offered him, Father offered him. Somebody says, why? Death is the only means by which the transgression of sin and iniquity can be properly dealt with. So I don't understand it. Yeah, you do. Come on. Think a little moment for a second or two. Huh? Come on now. Somebody murders your best friend, you want justice. And there's a legal system to, to go, going to give justice if it's first degree murder. Huh? They're going to die for their transgression. They're going to die for their violation against you. They're going to die for their violation against humanity. And you'll cry out for that justice. Oh, yes, you will. All men do. We watch it over and again. Those who want to try to play a, you know, humanistic game, a make-believe game of it isn't right to hold people responsible for their actions as soon as there is a violation against them, they, there's an outcry for justice. Satan, the powers of darkness, men violated this love and this purity and this goodness of God the Father. And he commended his love and made a way so that you and I could escape the damnation of eternity without him, the damnation of hell. Somebody said, I don't believe in hell. Why don't you just look around a little bit? Huh? There's a whole lot of hell going on. There's a lot of hell going on in this earth. Broken relationships, war, famine, death, and destruction. Everywhere. Somebody said, well, why did God allow that? You allowed it. I allowed it. Men allowed it. We've allowed Satan to do run over top of us. In every kind of expression from strife and broken relationship. You know, most, most, so many people have broken relationships. It's on a level that I, I, heard a, I heard a sociologist one time say that the majority of human beings do not have friendships to last more than five years. It's rare to find human beings with long-lasting relationships. Even in the family, siblings... Sibling rivalry is such that many brothers and sisters won't even talk to each other. We go around pretending, huh? Hold hands singing, thinking everything's going to get better. No, listen, I'm telling you right now. There's hell and destruction everywhere we look. There's broken relationships. There's envy and strife and hatred and division. That's not life. You know it's not life because it hurts you. It hurts you right where, right where it counts, right in your heart. It hurts you bad. Hurts father worse. Hurts him a whole lot worse. That's why David said, when I sin, I sin against you and you alone. Somebody said, ah, my sin isn't hurting anybody. Yeah, it is. First and foremost, it's hurting father who created you and gave you this life and allowed you the privilege of walking upon his sacred ground. Second of all, it's hurting you. It's destroying you. Next in line, is hurting those, your loved ones around you. I don't care what kind of sin it is. Adultery destroys families, destroys people, destroys the deepest relationships, bond. Fornication destroys lives, destroys young girls, destroys the children that come forth out of those events. Homosexuality. It's a violation against humanity on every scale in every way. Somebody said, oh, it's genetics. No, it's not. Prove it. It's not genetic. Prove that. Isolate the gene for me. Let me see it. Reproduce that idea. Let me see. Right? It's just, just do some gene transfer into a healthy genome. Let's see what happens. Nonsense. Philosophies. Ideologies. Wild-eyed hypothesis. Has no validation in truth. People just campaigning for their own cause. No, 
Demon spirits create identities. They impose identities upon people and demand them to have it. From the murderer to the insane person to the adulterer to the child abuser. Every form of iniquity, every form of sin. Somebody said, well, murder is one of the worst possible transgression against human life. It's really bad, I know. But all these other things are as well. Father makes it like this. He says, hatred is just as bad as murder. Hatred. Well, we don't scale it that way because we think we can get over it. You never get over it. You've not gotten over one single relationship you've had. Many people walk around deeply hurt and wounded because of relationship breakdown with their parents, father or mother. They walk around in a prison that no psychologist, no psychiatrist has medication, no psychologist has counseling enough to break off that yoke. There's no operation that can be performed upon the heart of man to take out that pain, that hurt creates walls and false beliefs and buffers against the pain and hurt and rejection that people feel. God in his love sent Jesus Christ to break it, to give us a new heart, to cause us to once again to be able to return to a place where we just love. I love love. I love every dimension of love. There's no part of love that I don't love. I hate hate. I hate it with a passion. I hate every dimension, every expression of hate. I hate it. And I know you do too. Whether you're sitting in here, watching by the web, listening to this on YouTube, you hate it. Because of the pain that it caused, the grief that it caused, the loss of sleep, the heartache. Father's come to show us how to live this life of love, this li live this life of relationship. Huh? He, says, he says, this is why love fulfills every dimension of the law. <laughs> In other words, the law is the expression of God's desire helping men to understand what's wrong. Tr showing men this is the right way and these things are wrong. Do these things and you'll live. Do these things and you're going to die. Yet you're going you're to get hurt from it now and you're going to get hurt from it in the future. And that's reproducible over and again. Huh? God in his love comes makes a way to break off the stronghold of hatred and death to break off the stronghold of every evil thing so that you and I can step over into his love. And he says, in this, and you live in the, walk in this love this is what God requires of us. And he said, this love will fulfill every requirement that I've ever had for mankind. It's the fulfillment of all the laws. It's the fulfillment of everything that the prophet said. This is it. Somebody said, oh, we just can't live right with, we just can't live right. It's just too difficult to live right. All you're saying is, is we just can't live in love. It's just too difficult to live in love. That's all you're saying. We understand that because it's only by the power of God that you can do this. The forces, the influences around us too strong for us by ourselves to live out this love life, to walk in this love. I want you to open your Bibles, please, with me to uh, Galatians chapter, um, chapter 6. And I want to show you something here in verse 15. Let me just say this, I welcome all of you. I'm glad that you're here. And I pray in Jesus' name that the events that God wants to work in your life today will profit you, that you won't reject God's love for you. It's a terrible thing to reject God's love for you. And when you love, and when you're filled with love for someone, when you begin to receive love from someone, a beautiful thing we begin to receive love from someone we learn to love them back and when you begin to receive God's love and you respond with the love that he has given and then on top of that pours into you 
You, want, you don't want to do it your way anymore. In other words, you don't want to just be selfish and do it your way. You want to please the one that you love. You're not going to violate the one that you love. And then when the one that you love says, listen, all I want you to do is love, walk in love, okay? Then there's so nobody should say, well, I believe I should be able to do it my own way. I believe I should live my life like I, like I feel is right and good. No, 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 no. Because then what, how limited is that? How limited is it to live your life the way that you think you should? How limited is that? I mean, my goodness, how much is it do you know? It would be limited by the measure of how much you know. And there is nobody knows very much. And here, Father says, no, no, no. I'm going to go ahead and give you the wisdom of the ages. I'm going to show you how everything can turn out good for you. I'm going to show you how to make decisions that won't backfire on you, won't ricochet on you, won't be, you won't, won't come back and hit you upside the head. Huh? It won't, won't ultimately cause destruction and pain and death in your life. Just, you know, if we could make right decisions, boy, would we ever be successful. Huh? If we could just make the right decision every time. We could be successful in every area of our lives. Paul says, I'm going to show you how to do this. I'm going to give you the rule of love. And if you walk in the rule of love and you do it my way, every decision that you make will be successful. I'm going to give you the power of this. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the insight of this. First, I'm going to give you my word. I'm going to give you my, my, direct, my instruction, my direction. And second of all, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit to come lead you and guide you. And the Holy Spirit, He's here right now. Spirit of the living God. He's here. He's here in person. Somebody said, well, if I could just meet God, if I could just come to know him, if I could just be introduced to him, perhaps I could believe. Well, he's here to meet you. He's here to introduce himself to you. God has not limited or held back any of his goodness at all from anyone. It's just that he's not going to impose himself upon you. You've got to be willing to truly, genuinely desire to know him. And today, if you genuinely desire to know him, then he's going he's to reveal himself to you. Right now, at this very moment, he'll begin to reveal himself to you. That should be with the slightest little faith in someone's heart or belief in someone's heart or truth in someone's heart. That should be motivation enough for a person to begin to respond and say, okay, well, I want to know you. Okay, well, I want to, I want to be introduced to you. Not a hypothetical kind of situation of, oh, God, okay, well, if you're really here, then, you know, go ahead, you know, show me what you got. Because nothing's going to happen there. But I have a sincere heart that wants truth. Did you know that, that your culture does not teach you how to pursue truth? That your culture, from the time you're in preschool, teaches you how to pursue a lie? Teaches you how to present yourself in a way that doesn't truly represent what you feel? All for the motivation and premise of being successful? To ultimately fit in and act like everybody else acts? To define for you the way that you think, the way that you behave. And they call that good. And then you accept that it is good and you say, well, these are the right things and these are the wrong things within the context of how I fit in in my community. Father wants to show you something that's far superior to all that. He wants to show you the community of heaven. He wants to show you truth in your inward parts and in your hidden parts. He wants, you to make, he wants to make known wisdom to you. He wants to show you what it really means to walk in love. He wants to show you what it really means to, to live life. And Jesus describes it as abundant life. Life that can't even be, life that's so rich and so wonderful that it's more than you can contain. You gotta go everywhere and just give all that love away. You got too much love to hold on, you just gotta go give it all the way. You got so much joy, you gotta just go get, you just gotta get flowing out of you. Hallelujah. You got so much, so much peace. 
This is, one, this is a wonderful life. And this is what I do. I check myself in the morning. Am I living an abundant life? Huh? And I'm not going to play make-believe. I'm going to make people, but just, you know, I'm, I'm going to know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel this presence. And, you know, many times what will happen is the Lord will show us things like, well, you know, no, you're not living an abundant life right now because you were, you, were, you were mean to your wife or you were mean to your husband. No, you're not living an abundant life right now because you haven't repented for that wrongdoing. Now, repent and get it right because that thing's going to hang on you. It's going to hang on to you. Your bad attitudes, your words that you spoke that were, that were untrue and unkind and false. The actions that you did, the violations that you committed in those actions and activities, choices that you made. And, 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 and people walk around under the load of that. They walk, they walk around under the burden of that. And they don't know why they're not feeling the joy. They don't know why they're not feeling the love. And they don't know why they're not feeling the peace. And they don't know why they're not feeling the goodness. The Lord just saying, repent. He's just saying, ask me to forgive you, not forgive you. Well, shouldn't the Lord just forgive us whether we ask him or not? No, because he's going to need to teach you how to walk in the life. He's going to correct you. Because if, if he just forgave you automatically without you confessing it, recognizing that it's wrong to forsake it, you just continue going on doing the same wrong thing over and over and over again. You got to recognize, no, that's wrong. That's sin. Most of the time when people just recognize wrongdoing as sin, call it sin, then they have a beginning to say, no, I'm not going to allow that in my life. It's evil, it's wrong, it's against God, it's against God's creation, I'm not going to allow it in my life. That's the beginning. So if I wake up in the morning, I don't feel abundant life, I recognize, my goodness, there's something I'm going to have to do. I, I don't feel the comfort of the Holy Ghost. I'm not being overwhelmed by His presence because He's a real person. He lives here. I'm going to tell you right now, you people, I, the, the greatest influence that you can walk under and, un, and in is the influence of the God, the Holy Ghost. It's a greater influence than joy. It's a greater influence than love. It's a greater influence than any other emotional influence that you have in your life. It's a greater influence than hate. It's a greater influence than unforgiveness. It's a greater influence than bitterness. It's a greater influence than any excitement that you could possibly name. The influence of the Holy Ghost. When you step into this relationship with Him, you know whether you're interacting with Him or not. True. And then bottom line of it is, you know, if there's a problem with the interaction, that means that there's a sin there and you need to say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. And as soon as you say, Lord Jesus, forgive me, he forgives you and is dealt with. And if something continues to go on, if there continues to be a problem, it's, something, it's, a, it's some other form of harassment and condemnation that you're going to have to deal with. And that's why pastors and ministers are here, help you work, work through and, uh, the, these various things that, that go on in your life spiritually that keep you from enjoying this abundant life that is in Christ Jesus, this wonderful realm of walking in the anointing, walking in the presence of the living God. Check yourself. Check yourself right now. Are you enjoying abundant life? Are you under condemnation and yoke and oppression of sin? Are you in confusion, doubt, things distorted for you? Or do you have clarity of who you are and where you're going? What you're going to accomplish. What, how do you define everything that you need and all your success? Is it all to found in hearing one day the Lord say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your rest. Is your, is your life defined by the fact it, it, that it could, is the greatest thing that you know and the greatest wealth that you have is to know that you've been born of the Spirit, that you're a son and a, a daughter of God. You're a child of the living God, which is only made possible through this new birth that is in Christ Jesus. It's not possible through religion. It's not possible to the ideology and philosophy of men. And so, Paul addresses this here in Galatians chapter 6. And he starts, in, 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 and of course there's a lot to say in Galatians chapter 6. This chapter is so loaded with the difference between doing it after human ability, trying to please God, trying to do the right thing after your human ability, versus pleasing God and doing the right thing because now the spirit of the living God lives and dwells in you and you depend upon him and rely upon him because you've been brought into union with him. Man, Adam had union with God. He had the same Holy Spirit. And in that union, though it may not have lasted for very long, there was no separation between him and everything 
that God had for him in a relationship where he could literally go walk around with God and throughout the midst of God's paradise, which we call the garden, paradise. Now, Father has brought that back. But there's a lot of people I see that they don't, they, they, they didn't live in that. They've never found the power of living in it. It's hard to have this life when you only want to try to do this once a week. When, when these things of the Spirit are only real to you on Sunday morning, or maybe some, for some people it's just Sunday morning. Some people it's just once a month. Some people it's just visitations on holidays. No, the reality of the power and the presence of God and the things that's life that I'm speaking won't be real to you. I'm talking about a life. I'm not talking about a religion. I'm talking about a life. You don't define your existence as a religion. You define your existence as a life. I'm telling you about another kind of life. I'm talking, talking to you not about human life. I'm talking to you about God life, the God kind of life that comes to us through the new birth, that comes to us because now our spirits join unto the Holy Ghost and now we get to experience what's coming down from heaven rather than what's coming up from hell. You gonna see what I'm saying? <laughs> It's, it's much better to live in a paradise than it is to live in a wilderness. Try to conceptualize that for a few minutes. I'm going to give you a few minutes to think about that. A wilderness where there is no water, there is no life, there is no shade trees. And it's about 110 degrees plus. Versus a paradise, a garden where there's rivers everywhere, every kind of fruit. It's a wonderful thing about one, some of the jungle places in uh, the South Pacific, like Papua New Guinea, there's always plenty of food. You can just basically, if, you're, if you can't find any food, just close your eyes, you'll run into a tree and something <laughs> will fall down and hit you in the head and you got something to eat. Uh -huh. I mean, it's, it's abundance of provision, you know, in this, pre in this presence of the Lord. You can't miss it. Even if you were blind, you can't miss it. Even if you were deaf, you can't miss it. Paul says here in verse 14, he says, he says, God forbid that I should glory in anything except for the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. He's laid out all of the things that he could have been of himself and all the things that he was by birth that was given to him just because of his birthright as a Pharisee the tribe of Benjamin, all the things that he had by birthright because of his family inheritance, all the things that he had because of his credentials and what he was within his culture and his community. He says, it's nothing. He said, I'm not going to glory in anything. The cross of Christ is the greatest power. I'm not going to glory in any dimension of my religion and the concepts of what my forefathers understood in relationship with God. He said, there is, he's really saying in Galatians chapter, the whole of Galatians, but here in Galatians chapter six, there's no power in it. There's only one place that there's power. There's only one place that there is life. And when we talk about power, we're talking about the power of life, the vitality of life. I mean, when men begin to consider that they live forever, and I think that if there's anything that we wanna see the strongholds of deception, removed from off of people's mind to understand is that you live forever. You live forever, and if you begin to deal with that a little bit, uh, you're gonna have a little, you're gonna have some more wisdom because I watch how people work so hard to take care of their life when they're unable really to work anymore, when they're unable to take care of themselves. They've got 401k plans and they've got savings accounts and they've got stock investments because somehow or other they're going to have to make it through those last few years of their life and they wanted to be as comfortable as possible. Those aren't the last few years of your life. Those are the last few years of your transition from this one into the next one. How are you preparing for the next one? How do you understand the way there? Why must men wait to have a deathbed wisdom and insight, deathbed conviction, where they're laying there on their deathbed, they know they're about to die, and they're saying, hmm, what if? 
this really does last forever and I'm getting ready to step into an eternity. I do not know the way thereof. I don't know how to take care of myself here. I don't, it's not up to me anymore. It's in the hands of someone else. Reality of it is, is your life is in the hands of someone else right now, whether you realize it or not. You've got one choice, and that choice is to turn yourself over to the living God and let him take care of you. Let him show you the ways of life, because what has happened, you've been taught every day the ways of death, and you've got to learn how to define the two. There's got to be a distinction so that you'll reject those things belonging to death and begin to let the Holy Spirit teach you about life. There's only one power that even begins to allow that to take place, and it's the power that took place at Calvary's cross when Jesus bore our sin in his own body. He died in my place. He took my sin upon himself, and I can see what my sin was worthy of. I look at the, I look at the stripes upon his back. I look at the crown of thorns upon his head. I look at the agony of the nails driven into his hands. I look at the agony of a busted, broken heart and body. The agony of the death that is produced because of the wages of sin. The power of the cross liberated me. The power of the cross of Jesus Christ will liberate you only because he's paid in full your debt of sin. Only because he is the stronger man who came and spoiled the one who ruled over your life, who ruled over your house, who ruled over your imaginations and your thoughts and your conduct and your manner of living. I'll glory in nothing, Paul said, except for the cross of Jesus Christ. I follow Paul in this and I say I glory in nothing except for the cross of Jesus Christ. Some people glory in their riches. Some people glory in their wisdom. Some people glory in their degrees. Some people glory in their profession. <laughs> even, a, even a garbage collector finds place to glory in his profession. Everybody's got some little room to glory. Paul said, I'm glorying nothing except for the cross of Christ because it's not only my value of life and meaning of life right now, but it's my value of life and my meaning of life throughout the ages to come. Hmm. The beautiful thing is, Father's made it so easy. He simply said, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and I'll come and I'll deliver you. I'll come and I'll save you. I'll save you from yourself. Probably your number one worst enemy outside of Satan. I'll come and I'll deliver you. I'll, I'll deliver you from your sickness, your disease. I'll deliver you from a life ultimately that you Choose for yourself in the sense of making your own decisions and finding over and over and again that those decisions were only wrong decisions and they only resulted in things that caused problems, death, and destruction and broken relationships once again. I come and give you an abundant life all through the power of the cross. Then Paul says, he begins to deal with what his whole culture and the whole value and meaning and understanding of his religious beliefs defined in verse 15. Because if you weren't circumcised, you weren't even a part of the covenant. There's a lot of people that all they can do is trust in their religious belief. They can't measure abundant life in their life. They can't measure a vital relationship with the Holy Ghost that has brought be different behavior and conduct in their life that has resulted in them having long-lasting friends. I mean, they're, they're, most churches have what's called transfer growth, you know. It's just, and, and, and I understand why, look, sometimes, look, listen, I understand there's a legitimate reasons to go from one church to the next church. There are legitimate reasons, okay? I'm going to tell you right now, if I wasn't in the Holy Ghost church, I'd get in one quickly. If I wasn't in a church where I was being fed in the things of the Spirit as well as the things of the Word, I'm moving, I'm going to go, I'm going to say, I love all you guys, come here, let me give you a hug and a kiss, I'm telling you, I love you, but let me just say, that there's something happening in, in my life, and, and God's revealed to me how I can just step into a greater dimension of what He has for me, and so that's what I'm going to do. And I'm, I'm telling you, I'm devoted to that in this place. I'm not just going to sing Kumbaya. I'm going to, I'm going to sing some songs that are I can touch heaven. I'm not going to be happy and contented with what uh, took place uh, last week, last year. My goodness, 10 years ago. I'm moving into a realm right now of a greater interaction with the living God. I'm going to clear out the way of everything in my life that would possibly hinder that. I'm going to clear out of the way everything in my conduct 
conduct and everything in my actions and everything in my manner that would hinder that because God has given me a freedom to be able to enjoy everything that he himself has and everything that he himself has is full of goodness and truth. I mean, when Moses wanted to seek God, when Moses wanted to have a greater encounter with God and God revealed himself, he said, listen, I'm telling you who I am. I'm full of long suffering. I'm full of mercy. I'm full of compassion, full of goodness and truth. The opportunity to sit with kings is nothing. The opportunity to sit with presidents and prime ministers is nothing. Huh? Elected officials. Actually, it's a bit, a bit more fascinating to sit with kings because it's royalty by birth. Presidents and prime ministers, they're elected. There'll be, a next one. There'll be another one soon. Just an office. Powerful office. But to sit with God Almighty, to be invited to come and sit at his table, to be invited to, to enjoy the things that he himself feels and that he himself knows. I mean, why pass up such an opportunity? So many people are stuck in the ditch of religion. Paul said, I'm not going to be stuck in the ditch of religion because he says in verse 15, circumcision has no power. That's what he says. He uses a power word. The Greek language is iskew. It is a power word. Everywhere you find it, it's power. I says, he, says, he says this, he says, and then there's different translations translated this particular word, Greek word, differently, but it's a power word. And I want you to just hear it. He's saying circumcision has no power. Circumcision has no ability. My religious belief, my religious affiliation. And he had the right religion because Salvation, Jesus said, belongs to the Jews. That's what he said, didn't he? To a woman at the well, he said, my, I, my people say we're supposed to worship over here. In this mountain, you say you're supposed to worship in Jerusalem. Jesus makes it very clear to her, look, you don't know why you worship. You're just throwing, you're just, you're just speaking into the air, basically is what he's saying. He says, salvation, those who, the only people that are given the right to know the living God are the Jewish people are the Israeli people, the Hebrew people. Somebody said, well, that's really narrow. Well, it's not so much that it's narrow in, in the sense that a person might use that word, being narrow-minded. It's that God found a man who was willing to walk with him and he blessed his family. And that man was named Abraham and a son that he had was named Israel. But God had always intended He'd always intended to open up the door and had that door even opened up, and there's proof of it to some degree. That door was opened up even unto the nations whom, you refer, whom the Bible refers to as Gentiles, but it's just a, another word for nation. And then we see that God had to have a family that wasn't out there worshiping demon spirits and worshiping idols, but one at least devoted to recognizing who he was so he could have himself a Mary, consecrated unto himself that he might bring forth the holy child Jesus through that he might bring forth his only begotten son through. So that was the consecration of the family. So it's not narrow in the sense of being narrow-minded, just limited to one group of people, and how is it that that one culture and one group of people supposedly have it all right? This is not that the one culture and one group of people have it right. God found him somebody to walk with so that he could bring forth a redeemer so that you would have an opportunity to be right with God right now. So it isn't about what happened in the past and it isn't about all the unknowns. It's about what you're going to do with this opportunity of salvation right now. It's about what you're going to do with living out this life in Christ Jesus right now. It's about what you're going to do of having the proof that you... Listen, there are a lot of people that sit in churches, they do not have the proof that they have the life of God. They have the proof that they have circumcision. They have the proof that they have, uh, you know, some kind of religious belief, in other words, but they don't have the proof that they have this life of God, the life of Christ, this abundant life. Their attitudes show it. Their demeanor shows it. Their lack of hunger and passion for God shows it. True. True. Paul says, circumcision has no power. Uncircumcision has no power. He says, and in another way, look at it, it, it has no power with God, has no meaning with God, has no value with God, has no ability with God. 
Circumcision doesn't result in you having an ability with God. Circumcision doesn't result in you having power with God. Your religious belief does not result in you having uh, power with God. Your, 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 your religious belief does not result in you having ability with God. What's the most important ability that you want to have with God? Being right with God. Being the child of God. Having the authority as a child of God. Having the position and the place with Him as a child of God. That's power. That's ability. That's a great, we call it great grace. He said, but a new creation is all that has power with God. Listen, that's what he says. A new creature, a new creation is all that has power with God. A new creation is all that has ability with God. A new creation is all that is acceptable to God. A new creation is what's going to result in this life of divine glory being made manifest in your life. This new creation is what's going to result in you being able to receive what the Holy Spirit is supplying right now. God spared not his own son, but gave Jesus up for us, offered his son up for us all. And now wants to freely give us all things by him. Right now, right at this very moment, if you are a new creation, if your heart's been made right with God, you have been given the power and you've been given the ability to receive all that that he is now supplying. <laughs> that, is a, that, is a, that is a powerful position to be in that right now you can receive a greater dimension of love a greater dimension of peace a greater dimension of joy a greater dimension of, of divine power a greater dimension of divine ability a greater dimension of wisdom and insight and a greater dimension of counsel a greater dimension of everything that belongs to the realms of heaven so that you can live out fully the life that Christ Jesus showed us that we could have huh this authority over everything it's a whole, it, defines all, it redefines all the laws of nature. Walk on the water. Command the wind and the waves. Redefines everything. It shows in every way, the life of Christ shows in every way that the life that God has given to us is superior to every natural law that would impose itself upon you. Sickness, disease, pain, heartache, torment, sufferings, everything that you can imagine. There's a life in Christ Jesus for you and me right now. The power of it is only realized through this new creation. A new creation that is a miracle. I, I ask people, have you been born again? Yes, I've been born again. I, then I get very specific. You have a different spirit than the one that you were born with. You have a different nature than the one you were born with. You have a different heart in other words, than the one you were born with. Then everybody starts backpedaling on me. Whoa, 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 wait, wait, what do you mean? That's the miracle of a new creation. He's Jesus. He's the one who says, behold, I make all things new. Has everything about your life been made new? And are you willing to live in it? Is it just, are you going from touch to touch? Uh -huh. Are you going rather from glory to glory? Uh huh? Are you going from relationship into a deeper dimension and expression of that relationship? Hallelujah. <laughs> is it more valuable to you than everything else? Is it a pearl of great price? Is it a treasure hidden in the field? Are these riches of life all found in this relationship with the living God who's present right now, not somewhere in a pri someone who's a prisoner in the heavens so far, far away, that one day after that we die, we'll go to see him. Then, 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 then we can interact with him. No, he's a very present God. He's a very present God with whom you have to do. Huh? He's a very living God, and it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God when you've not been living in his hands when you've not been living in his presence today the Lord wants to give you an opportunity he wants you to recognize that the sorrow and the sadness has nothing to do with his life it has nothing to do with the life of Christ he wants you to recognize that the arguments the opinions huh I, I recently sent out a daily bread said let all murmurings and disputings is what King James says but expression of your own opinions come to an end.
because that's what the word means. The logical conclusions is the Greek word that is used there for disputings or walking in your own opinions. Murmurings, talking behind the scenes. And then all basically says, you can get stop this talking behind the scenes. A lot of people talking behind the scenes. Because as long as you're talking behind the scenes, as long as you're constantly walking the expression of your own opinion, you know what? You're not shining his lights into a dark world. You're not living in the glory of God. You know, we, I could even reduce that down to practical application in the workplace. I'm going to tell you, you're not going to get promoted talking behind the scenes, being a trouble anchor. You're not going to get promoted. Even if it's your own business, you're not going to get promoted talking behind the scenes. If you're under the employment of, of a of a master, a boss, huh? And if you always want to express your opinions, you're not going to get promoted. You troublemaker. You're always arguing. Are you with me? You're just not going. It's not going to work out. It's just a basic principle of life, in every dimension of life, and far more so when it comes to the spiritual dimensions of life. Huh? Quit, quit talking behind the scenes. Quit murmuring. There's a life. You're not going to have to worry about that when you're so filled with this abundant life, when you're walking in this new creation and everything is good. You can hold fast those things which are good. And just because somebody said something you don't understand doesn't give you cause or right to go around and whatever. I don't want to even get into that stuff because it's the biggest problem that it faced, that's faced in the church right now. The church isn't held back from revival because there's not enough people fasting and praying. The church is held back from revival and advancement because there's not enough people willing to participate with the life that God has given. Just, as that's, just that simple. They want to do it their own way. They want to have it their own way. But it ain't going to work out for you that way. Father's give you, Father gives you an opportunity today to have everything made new. Somebody said, I've been trying. Well, listen, why don't we just start all over again? Huh? Hello? Somebody said, I've been trying. Well, why don't we just start all over again? Let's start all over again because, Father, every day his mercies are new. Listen to me. Look at me over here. Some of you looking down at the ground. There's nothing down there. Don't look down. Look up. Lift up your head. Your redemption draws nice. Here, even now, at the door. Behold, Jesus said, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. If any man opens the door, I'll come in. How hard is that? The Lord says, I want you to go around and start declaring to the churches in America, receive the life of Christ. What is the hardest part of it? People being stubborn and saying, what are you talking about? Who do you think you are? I already have the life of Christ. Yeah, that's conceived that that's really an expression of the life of Christ there, that attitude. You know, are you with me? Yes. <laughs> how hard is it to receive the life of Christ? Here it is. Here's how hard it is. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open up, his, open up the door of his heart, I'll come in. I'll fellowship with you. So simple. Just so honest the truth. Lord, I'll open up the doors of my heart. Whew. Open up the doors of my heart. If there's, anything that God, if there's anything that God's people want to experience, it is the real, genuine effects of His divine power interacting with them. The real, genuine effects of His divine power affecting their life. That's what the world is interested in. Seeing the power of God manifest through your life. I'm crying out to God today. I'm saying, Father, show me how to do it your way. I know, what the Lord, I know what the Lord Jesus would have you do. I know what the Lord Jesus would have me do. It's been written upon the pages of the Bible, his life story completely told to us while he was here. I know what he'd do. I know he'd be at the fairgrounds throughout the week seeking and looking for the one that is lost. Not to bring to them a religious notion, a religious ideology, but it's looking for someone who needs the power of God, who's hungry for the power of God to be revealed in their life. Hallelujah. I know what Father wants. I know what He says. I know He says, let's go wait for me. Go, if you don't know, if this isn't a reality in your life, if this isn't something that you're ready to go do, then go wait. Go get in the church meeting and don't leave the church meeting. You don't get this. They didn't just have a night meetings. 
And we're just having night meetings. When Jesus said, go tarry in Jerusalem until you be dude with power from on high, they weren't just having night meetings. They were there. They were in the meeting. Somebody said, the meetings are too long. That's the way the, that's the, way the breakthrough has always come. Long meetings where people have nothing more important on their heart and in their spirit than receiving this power from on high, this divine ability. Hallelujah. I, God wants you to be able to know this life. He wants to give you, in other words, divine power to know this life. He wants to give you divine ability to know this life. It won't come through your religious belief. It won't come through your religious affiliation. It won't come through your philosophy or your ide ideology. But it will only come because you've been made a new creation. Jesus described it like this. He said, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and change you into another person. He described it like this. He said, no man can enter into the kingdom of God unless he be born again. He says, describes it like this. You cannot see the things of the kingdom of God until you've been born of the Spirit. This new birth, where the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the living God, comes upon you and changes you into a new creation. If you've been changed into a new creation today, you know that you are. You know that Christ Jesus lives in you by his Holy Spirit. Then it's time for you now to take the next step of relationship with him and say, the world is crucified to me. Because everything that is in the world is an enemy of God. And I am crucified to it. It doesn't look good to me. It looks hideous to me, in other words. And I look hideous to it. I'm cut off from it, and it's cut off from me. The world. Why? Because I'm just interested in winning Jesus. I'm just interested in living out this life that has been made available to me in Christ Jesus. It has been made available to me that I can access through the power of the cross of Christ. I don't care about your past experience. It doesn't really matter to me. I care about you right now. In fact, what's more important to me right now is not your past experience. It's your present experience and your future experience. Too many people live as a prisoner of the past. Your past has no real bearing on you. Your past can only have value to you and meaning to you if it's something that allows you to move forward in that which is good. That's it. Or maybe what you define as good. But when it comes to walking with the living God, what's most important thing right now is where you're at at this moment and how easy God has made it for you to step into everything that he has for you. Because he removed, he's forgotten about the past. He's removed your sins far from you. He's not forgotten about the past if sin is still accounted to you because it's not been removed. Your sin will be held at your charge. But right now, once again, at this present moment, all of that is easily removed. It's easily erased. It's e e easily taken care of through the blood of Jesus Christ. It may not be easily forgotten by you. It may not be easily forsaken by you. It's a choice of your will. Imagine being born in a house where everybody's bickering and fussing and fighting. and That's, that's all you've heard all your life, and you're dysfunctional, and you don't know it. Psychologically and emotionally, you're, you're a classical dysfunctional per person because you were born in that. And you're going to carry it for the rest of your life. Imagine you were born in a house, uh, old, and from the time you were a small child, you heard your parents constantly talking bad about everybody, running everybody down. You're classically dysfunctional. You're messed up psychologically and emotionally. And I can go on and on and on. And I'm saying that because it's going to mess with your life. It's going, to, it's going to cause you to do the same things. And that's going to ruin your relationships. And that's going to ruin your opportunities and success just from a, nat just from a definable natural realm. 
far more from a spiritual realm. Father's got the mercy for it right now. Father's got the grace for it right now. You can be healed of it. You, that thing can be broken off of you. You can easily fall right back into the habit of it. You can easily go right back into the nature of it because you, you lived in that all your life. You were shaped and molded in that. Now you got to, now there's a new life, a new day has begun. Now God wants to come and bring you into the culture and the community of heaven begin to shape you with a whole new definition and meaning and value and sense of what's right and what's wrong. Won't you just let him? Behold, he stands at the door of your heart and he's banging. And he's saying, if you'll just open up, if you'll just open up, I'll come in and I'll fellowship with you. And then from this day forward, it won't be religion. It won't be about what you do on Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. It will be about what happens on Monday morning. Hallelujah. Into my heart. He came into my heart. He came into my heart. The Lord Jesus. He came in today. He came in to stay. He came into my heart. The Lord Jesus. I wake up every morning in a relationship with someone who's real. He's there. See, when, if you don't believe he's there, you can't get anything from him. Because they, the, the, anyone who comes to God must believe that he is, that he exists, that he's there. <laughs> and that he's a rewarder. He's a giver. He's a blesser. He's here to give to us what we, what we need. He, he spared not his own son, but offered him up for the sins of his all. How shall he not by him also freely give us everything that we need? Every morning I say, Holy Spirit, I'm not ang in anguish or desperation. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, please, oh, God, oh, God, rid the heavens and come down. Because that's doubt and unbelief. I just say, Father, I thank you that you're in my life. Holy Spirit, I turn my life over to you right now. Take control of me. He's asking, he wants you to ask him. You, the, if you think it's a default, forget about it. It's time for you to grow up now. It's a relationship. Holy Spirit, take control of my life. I know I can't live this by human ability. You've given me your divine ability. Take charge of me. I want nothing to do with this world. I want everything to do with heaven, everything to do with you. I don't want anything to do with my own way, my own understanding. I want to walk in your way, your understanding. It becomes a part of your life. Now you're really having a prayer meeting. Now it's not religious. Now you're really interacting with God. And I'm going to guarantee you this right now. By the, by the, by the, the vow and promise and oath of God, you will, you will, you will find an abundant life you will discover the power and the ability that is in God. If you ignore him, dear people, Satan is going to fill that void. Your past will fill that void. Your conversation, the way that you were raised will fill that void. Huh? Why is it that the easiest thing that grows in the garden are the weeds? <laughs> you don't need to water them. You don't need to fertilize them. You don't need to care for them. <laughs> Everything that you want and that's valuable, you got to take care of it. you got to take care of it. I want you to just go plant yourself a garden, ignore it for a week from Sunday to Sunday. I want you to go out there in that garden. Every Sunday, I want you to take care of that garden. It's going to be a pretty weak garden. You're going to give up on that garden because it's like, my goodness, didn't we just already do all of this? Yeah, but a week ago. And so it's all grown up again. Uh, there's a relationship to be tended. Drop in and visit your husband once a week. <laughs> all you're going to be talking about is where have you been? And that ain't going to be pretty. You're just talking about the offense. Huh? Drop in and visit your wife once a week. Oh, baby, you know I love you more than anything. I <laughs> you know, you're the most important person to me. This, and she's not going to believe it. What, I get you on Sunday mornings. Look, you can't put off onto God things that you know are not reality right now in your everyday experience. I want you to stand with me. Behold, he stands at the door and knocks. I said, behold, he stands at the door and knocks. He wants to have a real relationship, not a pretend one. Behold, he stands at the door and knocks. Hallelujah. And he never stops knocking. Uh, he never stops knocking. You, as long as you're breathing, he's knocking. Somebody said, well, I've committed the unpardonable sin. Well, you won't be breathing. He always stands at the door and knocks.
Today's Father's Day. I say y'all to all your fathers, happy Father's Day. I want you to know that you're going to fail with your children unless you'll follow the Father. You'll fail. The more you, the more you emulate Father, our Heavenly Father, the more possibility you have of success. I'm going to tell you, unless you walk with Jesus, it ain't going to work out for you. All your great plans, all your hopes for the future, all the things you... People say, where did I go wrong? I can answer that question for people over and again. You didn't follow Jesus. That's where you went wrong. Can't go wrong following Jesus. Hallelujah. It's happy Father's Day to Father in heaven. Say to the Father, God, Father, thank you for being a father, for being willing to be a father. Because he became a father the day that he took the only begotten son, his word, which was his eternal, his word that was with him, who was God, was with God. And he said, today you're going to become my son. This day I will call you my son. So that you can go redeem Mark, because I want him here. I want him with me. And put your name there. Because you need to receive God's love for you personally. I talked to the Father. I said, Father, I, I thank you that you love me so much that you send Jesus just for me. And I just stand there and think about that for a while. And any, 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 any concerns or doubts about his love for me that the enemy would try to put on me flees away. Father, thank you that you love me so much. that you spared not your own, your own son, but offered him up for my sin. Lord, I never want to sin against you again. Lord, I never want to do anything wrong. I never want to violate the trust with you. I thank you that you strengthened me and that you empower me. I thank you that you blessed me that I might see all the beauties and splendors of life. I love life. I'm a country boy. I love being in the mountains. I'm at home in the woods. One day I... One day, a, a rancher was telling me, oh, I'm concerned, man. If, if those big cities fall apart, they're all going to come out of here and they're going to steal from us. I said, don't worry. I said, you're too far in the woods, man. They wouldn't know where to even begin. Those are city people. They only understand, they only understand si sidewalks, traffic lights, and street signs. <laughs> but those of us born in the country, we love the woods. We're at home. We know exactly where we're at. Huh? We have a built-in GPS system out there. <laughs> we don't need a sign. I love life. I love creation. I love the beauty of it. I love to look at, I love ornithology. I love the study of birds. Birds, just studying birds. There's no end to it. The variance of species is amazing. I mean, I don't care what it is. The amazing variety of flowers and plants. The study of botany. Amazing. Love them. I love to study xylem and phloem and all the rest of the stuff. I love it. Photosynthesis. An amazing thing that God put together. To take this wonderful quantity of light and turn it into something as nutrients in my body. I love cattle. I mean, my goodness, Father, you're amazing. You've got this wonderful creation that takes grass that I can't eat and converts it into something so delicious. Father's life, his trees, the majesty of everything that he's made. You get outside the city, you can just stand there and look up at the, the expanse of the universe. And it goes far beyond anything that we can ever imagine. imagine. You can not only not count the stars, you can't number the galaxies. And galaxies are made up of many solar systems. Amazing. I, I just, I was uh, with um, my dear friend, Balkrishna Sharma from Nepal, and we stopped by, took him out to the Pacific Ocean. We picked him up to the airport to bring him here. And we were standing there on the shores of the ocean, and he goes, 
you know, I'm a Highlander. Himalayas? It's about the, high, about the highest you can get as a Highlander. And I never saw the ocean until about 10 years ago. He said, when I saw it, all I could do was just stand there with my mouth open and I couldn't take my gaze off of the expanse of such a huge body of water. Everybody else was talking and wanting to leave and I was just stuck. God's creation is amazing. The greatest creation he ever made was the day that he made Jesus Christ to come save you, come deliver you, come change you. Flowers look better, the stars will shine brighter. I'm telling you, the value of every living thing will take on a whole new meaning because life becomes real to you. It's not obscured by death anymore. The light begins to shine. You're not living in the darkness no more. It's true. So instantly, so instantaneous. I was with a, a young man, Japanese guy from Japan, because Japanese people can be from America or UK. And we were in the science department, third floor of a science building, doing stuff in, in the chromatography lab. And he's decided that he wanted to accept Jesus into his life. Laboring over a chromatograph. And an NMR. Analysis. He said, well, you know what? I want to accept Jesus in my life. I said, right now, right here, in this place. Smells of, smells of every chemical you can think of. Right now, the power of God comes into your life. Right now, the transformation of nature is here for you. He closed his eyes, and he says, yes, Jesus, come into my life. Open his eyes, and he says, wow, it's so bright in here. Did you turn on more lights? I said, no, 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 no. He said, everything, look, everything is so beautiful. Transformation of his life took place there. He was born again. It doesn't matter where you're at, and this is the best place ever, right here in the church. Ha, <laughs> ha. Right here in that which Jesus Christ purchased with his own blood. This holy assembly. Did I pray in the name of Jesus? Those of you who've called upon the name of the Lord, you'll understand how sacred this is. This holy assembly that belongs to him. The holy ground that you tread upon. Today, just say, Jesus, come into my heart. Just ask him, he'll come. Behold, you don't have to beg him. Behold, he's begging you. He's already standing there at your heart's door, knocking on it. <laughs> Before you even called, he answered. Before you sought him, he said, behold, here am I. Now, in the name of Jesus, I command in Jesus' name for every person in this place, repent and be converted. Repent. Repent. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Lord Jesus, I, I, I renounce sin and, and I renounce the things of this world. I don't want them in my life. I don't want, I don't want those things that produce death. I mean, it should be for easy for everybody to say that. And as you gained more wisdom, if you lived long enough, you would gain enough wisdom to recognize that every sin produces death and destruction. And thus you'd repent of it. If science is given long enough, they will ultimately come to the conclusion of everything that is written in the Word. It's just that we don't have that much time. I think the anthropic theory is a great proof of that. Science now has more of the values and the numbers and the parameters. There's only one conclusion to make. Because you get more and more of the knowledge, there's more and more clarity. A little knowledge in the hands of any person is a dangerous thing. A warped and twisted idea is all that could be conceived. Now in the name of Jesus Christ, today, believe the good news. The good news. God loves you. The good news. 
your sins and your iniquities, he will forgive and pardon and remember them no, no more. The good news, behold, I make all things new. One day, in the not too distant future, Father is going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And it is going to be spectacular. It is going to be beyond amazing. I know it's hard for people to relate and fixated on all of the stuff's coming out of exhaust pipes here in the cities. They walk around in the concrete jungle, can't see the sky at night. But believe me, God's got some good things that he's created in creation. And it's going to be far better because he's going to name. Ooh, he's going to make everything new. Everything more spectacular. We want you to be there. We want you to be there. We want you to be numbered in those who said, Lord, I'm on your side. From this day forward, Lord, I'm on your side. The Lord Jesus came to deliver us. That's what Savior means, so that we could be with him and be on his side. So today, I want you to say to the Lord, Lord, I'm going to be on your side. Lord, I want to be on your side. I'm going to be on your side. And that's it. That's for this is the way I'm going to live my life. I repent for my sin. I don't want it in my life. I'm not going to be on the side of wrong anymore. I'm going to be on the side of right from this day forward. You open your mouth and you start screaming at your spouse, you just shut yourself down and say, wait a minute, that ain't on the side of right. Stop that right now. Holy Ghost, come fill my mouth with love and goodness and kindness and pleasant words. Come fill my mouth with words that bring joy to the heart, life to the spirit, goodness to the soul. Let me be a blessing with the things that I say. Ha, ah, he'll teach you. He'll teach you. No, can't learn it anywhere else. Can't learn anywhere else. It's the power of salvation. Just let your hands towards heaven. Let God touch you. Just let him touch you. That's it. Just let him touch you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Say, Lord, you are mine, and I am yours. <laughs> Say, Lord Jesus, I follow you. I'll do what you do. I'll go where you go. I'll be what you showed us to be. Amen. Amen. Now, in the name of Jesus Christ, I release you from every sin. I take the blood of Jesus Christ and I place it upon you. And I say to you, by the authority of the living God, you have a new heart and you have a new spirit. You belong to the living God. You're his. You're not your own. Now, from this day forward, live for him, not yourself. From this day forward, walk in the spirit. Receive the Holy Ghost and walk in the spirit from this day forward for the rest of your life. Just let everything be good. Amen. 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 Let everything be new. Behold, all things are destroyed. They passed away. They're gone. Behold, all things are new. And all things are of God. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Oh, we want you to find a bunch of people around you, hug them, bless them, tell them that you love them. I want to pray for anybody who wants prayer. If there's, if there's anything you want prayer for, I want you to come. Also, we want you to come and worship the Lord with your giving. Come worship the Lord with your tithes and with your offerings. Come worship the Lord. Come bless the Lord with that which he's blessed you with. And he's promised to take it and increase it and multiply it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus.